The sounds you just heard are gobbles of wild turkeys here in Stevens State Forest. Not very many people have seen a wild turkey, but there are literally hundreds of them in this small tract of forest land in south central Iowa. There are scattered populations of them elsewhere in the state also that have been introduced by the Iowa Conservation Commission. Tonight we're going to look at the, the wild turkey in Iowa. Benjamin Franklin thought that the wild turkey ought to be our national bird. It's always been associated with wildness and naturalness, and anyone who's ever seen one can tell you it's a very exciting experience. Benjamin Franklin called them a noble bird. Well, besides looking at that noble bird itself, we're going to look at some of the studies that wildlife biologists are doing with the population here in Stevens. Wild turkey is native to Iowa, but was extinct in the state until it was reintroduced in this century. Iowa used to have large areas covered with the kind of forest habitat that the wild turkey needs. Most of those forest areas are gone now, but the Stevens State Forest is an exception. So this is one of the areas where turkeys have thrived since they were brought back to the state. The eastern wild turkey is the subspecies which was native in Iowa. This is only one of six subspecies that at one time covered a large portion of what is now the United States. Our domestic birds are descendants of the Mexican wild turkey, native to this area. Turkeys were first domesticated by the Indians of Central America, who raised them primarily on corn. We have been involved in uh, a fairly large turkey restoration program for about the past five years, uh, transplanting wild birds to various timbered areas all over the state. And uh, as a result of this release program, we are seeing turkey populations in uh, timbered habitats that we did really not expect them to uh, survive and do well in at all, uh, where we released them on a for pretty much on an experimental basis. And uh, because of this, we, uh, these birds were surviving in these small scattered timber blocks. We wanted to know more about why these birds were doing as well as they were in Iowa. The wild turkey is supposedly a bird that can only survive in large, uh, extensive tracts of timber, 10,000, 20,000 acres, and we just don't have that much timber in Iowa in any one block. Our timbers tend to be small, scattered blocks along river bottoms and that sort of thing. Plants oh, this remain this viable. There's no actual good evidence or experimental work that's ever been done on this, but indirect evidence and superficial evidence would indicate that most of these seeds will last at least 20 to 30 years, and some of them probably will last 70, 80, 90, or 100 years. Um, well, we've taken cores down into the mud and uh, taken off layers at a time and tried to germinate seed just by spreading those layers of mud out in pans in the greenhouse, and we get seeds germinating from soil samples that come from like 15, 18 inches deep into the mud, which would mean probably they've uh, been there for 25 or 30 years. Dr. Davis, why are you involved in this kind of a study here in a marsh rather than some other kind of study of, of uh, plant life? That's a good question. <laughs> well, neither of us started out as marsh ecologists. Uh, Dr. Vandervalk started out uh, working with uh, sand dunes on the East Coast, and I worked in the Chaparral in California and in forests in Michigan. But uh, if you're going to study natural vegetation in Iowa, you don't have very many choices, and uh, this type of uh, ecosystem is one of the, uh, the few natural types of ecosystem in, in the state of Iowa. It also uh, offers an opportunity to, to study a whole ecosystem where we can measure inputs to the ecosystem and outputs. It's what you might call a, a nice unit that uh, is easy to study because of its uh, uh, distinctness from the surrounding environment, either the forest uh, to the west of us or the agricultural lands to the east and south. Dr. Rowley works with several species of mosquitoes that are common in Iowa. Some of these are what we call pest mosquitoes, that is, they are merely annoying. Others carry dangerous diseases, such as encephalitis and dog heartworm. Mosquitoes breed in, in water, aquatic habitats of one type or the other, and often fly large distances or long distances from these breeding sites into populated areas. We know of, of some salt marsh mosquitoes on the Atlantic seaboard, for example, that are capable of migrating 100 to 125 miles in a single night. And uh, Iowa mosquitoes don't fly that far. 
but they're certainly capable of flights of, of up to uh, 15 to 20 miles. So they generally wouldn't have to fly that far probably in Iowa? Then. Generally they don't. Often we raise our own mosquitoes in our backyard. In studying mosquito flight, Dr. Rowley takes advantage of something that scientists have known for over 40 years. That is, when insects are suspended so that their tarsi, or feet, are not touching a surface, they will fly continuously. Most of the, of the uh, apparatus was developed in the laboratory where I was working. Uh, the attachment process, in, in other words, getting the mosquito onto that little arm so that it can fly uh, in a manner that is somewhat similar to what it would fly in nature is the tricky part. And actually, the, the gluing or the attaching of the mosquito to what we call a flight mill arm was very difficult, and it took a long time to resolve that process. We tried a number of glues and adhesives and, and methods for attaching mosquitoes until we came up with a, a solution that worked. On the flight mill, you're measuring the <coughs> how far the insect flies. You're not measuring how much work it's doing in the process. No, actually, the system is set up so that that uh, the flight mill arm itself is perfectly balanced. And uh, once the mosquito begins to fly, then it's just carrying itself. There is very little work involved. The, uh, the aerodynamics of the system has, has uh, been worked out. And uh, it's uh, as near as we can possibly do in this type of situation, uh, a reasonable estimate of the flight ability of, of a particular mosquito. In order to separate the effect of one environmental factor that would influence flight from another, Dr. Rowley uses an environmental chamber. Now this really looks like a meat locker, but it allows Rowley to control all sorts of things like temperature, humidity, and air currents. Would you describe this research as being more basic or applied or a combination of both or what type of? It's definitely a combination of the two. Actually, we're, we're interested in mosquito flight as a, an entity in and of itself and all of the ramifications associated with it. And, uh, we hope that it has some application in that uh, if we can determine uh, some of the characteristics that, that uh, mediate uh, mosquito flight, this may be of some value to uh, mosquito control and abatement programs. It, it certainly has value in terms of studying the epidemiology of the diseases we were just talking about. It's very important to know how far a particular species of mosquito can fly. From Rowley's study of mosquito flight, we moved to a project that could eventually lead to mosquito control. Graduate student Sarah Lindquist is studying the feeding habits of tiger salamanders, which are also relatively common in Iowa. Again, we're looking here at a study of a single organism. I guess the natural question to ask is, why would someone study feeding behavior in salamanders? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, it's just a general feeding behavior study, not really related to salamanders, just an attempt to try to quantify behavior. Most of the literature prior to this time has been spent on description of what an animal goes through, but behavior really hasn't been quantified. How many times do these animals go through these acts? What percentage of time do they spend in certain feeding procedures, things like that? So it's just a feed, general feeding behavior trying to quantify material. Second of all, like I said, not much is known about salamanders at all. And so I select this animal, just the, the fact that there's a lack of knowledge on that animal. And essentially, the role of salamanders in the ecosystems ha is not well known. Um, a general feeding behavior like this perhaps can be a pilot study used for something that my major professor and I have been discussing, is the, the role of tiger salamanders in control of mosquito populations. A general feeding behavior study here, such as how they find their prey, what prey they will take, perhaps could give us an idea of how they spend their time out in nature. And we were thinking in terms of biological control, salamanders in a farm pond may be taking a large supply of mosquito larvae each year and, in fact, be a good control for something like mosquito populations. The larval salamanders spend the entire summer in these farm ponds, sloughs, um, ditches. The adults spend most of their time there in the early spring, really. A lot of data has been taken on stomach contents of these animals, and they have found significant amount of mosquito larvae in the stomachs of 
of larval salamanders and adults. The laboratory apparatus for this project is a four-foot square box marked with a grid design that Lindquist uses to plot the exact movements of her animals. A mechanism rigged with an electric drill and fishing line allows her to suspend and move a controllable plastic worm over the box. What I'm using this box for now and the reason it's gridded is I wanted to talk about, I wanted to get a handle on how far these animals will respond to a cue such as a visual stimulus or a chemical stimulus and what acts they would go through trying to find that food item. Okay. How do you suppose a setup like this uh, compares with the type of habitat that these organisms would normally be found in? Do you think the, in the information that you're finding out is comparable to what they do in nature? Well, I assume just their behavioral repertoire, the acts, the possible movements that these animals can go through would be the same in this box, the same as in nature. I think the difference would be is what percentage of the time they spend an ax or what, perhaps what sequence they go through when they get, an a, a, get a, well, something like an earthworm. I'm really not sure if they do most of their feeding on the surface, which would be comparable to something I've got here, or whether they do a lot of feeding underground, in which case that'd be a very difficult study to try to do here in the lab, or in fact, in the field, I think. To this point, we've looked at several kinds of basic research, and most of the biologists involved in that research have in mind some practical application of their work. We thought that Dr. Eugenia Farrar, a zoologist researching bullfrog endocrinology, said it particularly well when she said that the unknown quality of what a scientist might find provides part of the rationale for her studies. There are lots of different reasons for studying uh, animals that aren't mammals. I like to think of the analogy of how in endocrinology uh, the parathyroid gland which controls your calcium level was discovered in the rhinoceros. And somebody would say, well, why did we ever bother to look at the rhinoceros? And it's a good thing somebody did dissect one of these great big creatures because they discovered a gland that had previously not been known. And it turned out to be very important to all of humankind and medicine in the uh, physiology of everyone. So you don't know what you may come up with as part of the excitement of it. What we're doing right now is a project involving the study of the activity of the nervous system of the earthworm using animals which are totally undissected and undisturbed. We can actually pick up the electrical activity arising from nervous system elements and record this and analyze this and uh, also correlate the electrical activity of the nervous system with the overall behavior of the animal. And this is a relatively new approach with where you actually work with undissected animals. Yeah, actually the earthworm offers an opportunity to pick up the activity of individual nervous or nerve cell elements without ever having to go in and surgically interrupt or disturb the animal. In the case of earthworms, there, there are very large nerve fibers within the nervous system which produce rather large electrical signals which can actually be picked up right from the surface of the skin of the animal. And uh, let me just turn this down a little bit. The electrical signals can be picked up right through the skin of the animal um, and we can analyze that activity then without ever having to go into the animal. Uh, so this is, the this is the advantage of working on the earthworm, uh, mm -hmm. it's the, the amenability or ease of studying it. Plus you can easily get them into the laboratory, you don't have to... Well, I, I can collect <laughs> them in my backyard, <laughs> that's an important <laughs> feature in, also. Except in the wintertime, maybe. Uh, well, do you want to show us something about... Well, let me just you explain to you the, the, the arrangement that we have here. We have our earthworms within this circular 
arena, which is basically two concentric plexiglass rings. The animal actually crawls over an array of recording electrodes, which are basically silver wires. Um, these recording electrodes then can pick up the electrical activity generated by the nervous system of the animal as it crawls over this, the, the surface of this arena. The neural impulses picked up by the electrodes are individually amplified, recorded, and analyzed in a sophisticated custom-built setup in Dr. Drew's laboratory. This basic research with earthworms may lead to a broader study of how pesticides and other environmental factors affect these animals. Well, now that kind of thing, the effects of, of environmental factors, pesticides and the like on, on the animals in that environment, seems many, many steps removed from something as, as basic as an earthworm crawling across electrodes. Actually, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not at all very far removed. We could very easily raise our earthworms under varying conditions or concentrations or under the presence of various kinds of pesticides and then test directly the effects of those contaminants or pesticides on the functioning of the nervous system. We can actually very easily determine the rates of, of conduction of nerve impulses down the length of the animal and compare the uh, conduction rates for those nerve fibers under the normal conditions versus the uh, conditions with the, with the pesticides present. The equipment in Dr. Drew's laboratory shows how much of modern biology depends on sophisticated, often custom-built equipment. In studies at the cellular level in biology, no other single modern instrument has had as great an impact as the electron microscope. There are two types of electron microscopes. The scanning electron microscope allows the scientist to view the surface of minute structures. To view the interior microstructure of cells, biologists use a transmission electron microscope, which provides greater magnification. Dr. Joseph Viles, a cell biologist, uses a transmission microscope to monitor biochemical changes within liver cells. To use this instrument, the specimen must be cut or sectioned. Viles explains how that is done. The material that we have prepared for sectioning is embedded in this little block of plastic. And when we want to section the tissue, we trim the plastic away from the block to form a very small pyramid, such as you see here. Then mount the block in a holder, such as this. Then the holder is mounted in the microtome, like that. And this particular microtome is set up to uh, give us sections of 500 angstroms or less in thickness. And that's perhaps a thousand sections out of the thickness of a dime. We use a, a special knife for sectioning, a piece of glass which has been broken. We use the fractured edge there, the fractured plane, as the cutting edge. Now when glass, the molecular structure of glass is such that it, it forms a uh, pyramidal crystalline structure and when you break it, it tends to break along the, the pyramid structure so you wind up with a single molecular layer of silicon oxide at the very surface. We have the broken knife and then we have a boat made out of plastic tape which is wrapped around the top of the knife. Now this boat is filled with water. The microtome will drop the sample down over the knife edge. A section is cut off and it floats directly out on the water surface. When we pick the sections up with a copper grid. It's got about 300 holes per inch in the surface. We simply dip the uh, dip the grid into the water boat like this and then pick the sections up on the grid surface, drain the water off underneath, and uh, they're ready to be stained and examined with a transmission electron microscope. We apply high voltage to the filament. Okay, 50,000 volts of electricity is applied to a, a tungsten filament that's contained in this part of the microscope. It projects, well, as the high voltage goes through it, it boils off electrons, and just like a lamp filament in an electric light, 
and the uh, electrons are projected down the column through the specimen. And then this series of lenses in this region and in this region spread that beam, spread the electrons out so that we can then magnify the image that we look at uh, on the screen here. Because we're using electrons, we have to use uh, electromagnetic lenses. So these are really giant electromagnets. We focus the beam with the electromagnetic field generated by these lenses. Our last visit was with Dr. Donald Nevins, a plant physiologist. The development of his research points out clearly how research into a basic problem, in this case it was with plant hormones, has matured very quickly into a medically important investigation. Well, I was raised on a, on a farm and took my academic training in agriculture with the idea of, of uh, learning to improve the basis for agricultural productivity. Well, I, I still am uh, primarily interested in agricultural research, but it, at one particular point I decided that what we really needed for agricultural research was some, um, some idea of fundamental processes in plants which led, led to crop productivity or improvement of crop productivity. And uh, I decided that I could spend my time during the next 15 years after getting my degree or so in, uh, in studying some of those fundamental processes which will have later application to direct uh, productivity in agriculture. Nevin's research involves a biochemical study of plant hormones. He uses the seedlings of corn and oats to study these compounds. Very little was known about how cells enlarged, how they became uh, 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 elongated to form uh, taller plants or larger seeds. And so uh, we examined some of, the, some of the known information and recognized that uh, a lot of this is controlled by hormones, which are very simple substances in plants, um, which have very profound effects. While studying plant hormones and plant growth, Nevins isolated a molecule in the cell wall of corn seedlings which could have an important impact in the field of medicine. During the last two years, I suppose, uh, we, we made an intense, intensive uh, investigation into the structure of some of the key pro uh, compounds which are components of the cell wall. We feel that these particular components, our interest in these components was uh, their role in plant growth. Um, and so we characterized them very carefully so that we could understand the molecular interactions. These compounds that we've isolated uh, appear to be very, very similar in structure, in structure to uh, some compounds which have anti-tumor capacity in certain types of, of animal cancer. Nevins has recently submitted a proposal to the National Cancer Institute asking for funds to further study these compounds. I'm not an expert in, in, uh, in animal or medical sciences, but um, <clears throat> our part of the work, of course, will be to, to characterize the compound further characterize it structurally, prepare uh, purified samples, and then submit these for additional testing.